My next guest is somebody that is in charge of our elections here in Alabama. It is indeed the Secretary of State of our own state, the great state of Alabama. Secretary John Merrill joins us right now. Good afternoon, Mr. Secretary. How are you, my friend? I'm doing quite well. How have you been? Everything's great. I'm excited to have an opportunity to visit with you today. Well, we're certainly glad that you've agreed to come on the show with us. You've always been very, very generous with your time. I know that you've got a lot to do, especially right now with an election. Just, what is it, 78 days away, I think, now? That's right, and 75 days until the election, and 70 days before is the last day you can make application for your absentee ballot. Right. So a, a lot of very important deadlines coming up for you and your department. So I know that, you know, you've been paying attention to the news. We've all seen in the news. There's been a lot said and, and probably a lot said incorrectly about mail-in ballots, absentee ballots. And, and that's been a very hot topic of discussion. And so I thought, who better to talk to us about that than the man that's in charge of handling all of that for our state? So uh, I, I know that there's a lot of ignorance on this issue, and frankly, some of it even from me. Like, I think that because it, it's not a sexy issue, it's not something that really grabs people attention, uh, people's attention most of the time, a lot of us are not starting out with a whole lot of knowledge on mail-in ballots and how they work. So if you could just give us a baseline, talk about what the mail-in ba ballots are and, and what they do in the state of Alabama, what our voting laws are for mail-in votes and how it compares to other states in the union. Well, look, that's a great question. And I think it is incumbent on us to make sure our voters understand the difference between universal voting by mail and absentee voting by mail. In universal voting by mail, what that would mean in the state of Alabama is that all 3,631,381 registered voters in Alabama would receive a ballot mailed to the address that they had provided for their addition to the voter rolls. Mm -hmm. Whatever address they had, they would get a ballot mailed to them whether they wanted it or not. Now, with the absentee voting by mail, the voter would have to indicate to the absentee election manager through an application process that they would like to have an absentee ballot mailed to the address that they provide and they have to include a copy of their valid photo id mm -hmm. once that happens they successfully return it they will have a ballot mailed to the address that they assign and then they can cast their ballot for the candidate of their choice Right. So a, a big difference there with just having it sent to you by merit of you being registered to vote versus you actually requesting it. Uh, I know that a lot of Alabamians have probably not ever gone through the process of absentee voting. I have once in my life because I was living in Auburn at the time and I had classes on Election Day. There was no way I was going to be able to make it back to Millbrook to be able to vote. And so I went through the absentee ballot process. And granted, that was a few years ago. I, I guess it would have been about a decade ago now. Uh, but the process was was very simple. Uh, I could see how maybe you could try to abuse it if you were trying to work around the system. But from what I could tell, very secure. I had to identify myself. I had to let the people in Elmore County know who I was. And they had to check off that I was actually registered there. And I, that was my actual address. And so um, I, I, th that is a world of difference than just everybody on the voter rolls getting a ballot mailed to them. Absolutely. And a couple of other things that I think need to be noted. Number one is the states that do this the best, which are Washington, mm -hmm. Oregon and Colorado, will tell you that in order to initiate the universal vote by mail effort, your state should have at least 60 percent of your ballots currently being returned by mail. So the next question for your very informed listeners would be, well, where is Alabama in that number? Well, we're at 4%. So we're 56% from the position where we should even begin the conversation. The other thing that you need to know is that those states will tell you that in order to successfully implement this effort, it takes a five-year period to make sure it's done right and well. Not mm -hmm. five months, five years. The other thing that you need to know is that in order for us to pay for an election, it costs five and a half million dollars per election segment. So for a primary, for a runoff, 
and for a general election, it would be $16.5 million. Now, if you just look at one segment of the universal vote-by-mail effort, it cost $18.5 million. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about a difference between $60 million and $16.5 million. That's something that needs to be given some consideration as well. So in the state of Alabama, there are massive logistical issues, is what you're saying, to moving to this. There's no way we could do it by the time that the November election would come up. It would be very difficult to even pull it off between now and the next presidential election. And also there's budgetary concerns on top of all that, is what you're saying. You got that right. And it's the same for every state in the union that is just now considering implementing this. No matter Mm -hmm. how much money the federal government gives you through the CARES Act or through the HEROES Act or through other resources that come from them to you, you need to understand that this is not an easy thing to do. There are very few fulfillment houses in the nation that actually have the wherewithal to be able to provide a ballot to the total number of registered voters in any state in the union. And those fulfillment houses that currently do this for those three states I mentioned earlier, as well as Hawaii and Utah, Mm. are at maximum capacity. As a matter of fact, some of them were not even able to make their standard met because of people who were impacted by the COVID back in April, May, and June. Right. And one of the things, and this is part of the reason that I knew that you were the person we needed to talk to on this, uh, a very, unfortunately, very common reaction to all of this is that if you're against mail-in ballots, then it's just because you don't care about people and you don't care about the pandemic, you're not taking it seriously, and you don't want people that are sick or are vulnerable to vote. Um, To which, you know, I've said that there's, like you said, and, and laid out much better than I could, Uh, There's all kinds of logistical issues. And on top of that, and this has always been my response, was like, because the the vast majority of the people making this argument happen to be the ones that are pulling against President Trump in this upcoming election. I was like, why would President Trump intentionally disenfranchise his most loyal voting bloc, which is elderly people? That's right. And the other thing that needs to be remembered is that in order to have this effort be successful, Mm -hmm. you need to be able to implement it without any obstacles. And most people would have to pass legislation. Many of our legislators are not in uh, a position to be called back for special sessions now, or they're not having their regular sessions. So it puts a number of states at a significant disadvantage in order to even consider something like this at this time. Okay, so we've talked a lot about the logistics and some of the roadblocks to that. Let's actually dive into, are there significant security concerns? Like, even if we had the five years, even if we had the budget to do it, uh, are mail-in ballots inherently more dangerous or more prone to fraud, I guess is the best way to say it, than in-person ballots? Are there extra security concerns there? Well, there are very significant security concerns. One of those is what they call the signature match, Mm -hmm. where they say that they take the mailed in ballot and they match the signature against the one that's on file with the voters uh, name in the central polling site. Mm -hmm. Now uh, it's difficult to convince me that they're actually evaluating each and every signature that comes back because I know how much time it takes for us whenever we have individuals that submit petitions, try to gain ballot access And we're only talking about approximately five or six thousand names that have to be matched against a voter list. And when you're talking about people that would be concerned about getting the returns in on time, having people know who the winners were on Election Day and to think that those signatures could be matched in a short period of time, we're not being realistic. Yeah, and that's a, I would say it's a secondary concern, but it's not one that should be written off just because it is secondary. The time in which it would take to count these are are significantly longer with the mail-in ballots. And I mean, I I hate to say it, but with the state of our republic and the way that it is and and the divisiveness, I just don't think anything dragging this out, because I mean, you remember just as well as I do, I mean, I was a kid then, but uh, how incredibly nasty it became in the country when we were debating back and forth with the whole hanging chads thing with Al Gore and George Bush. And I just think like from a, 
you know, almost from a spiritual standpoint, that cannot be something that is good for the country to have to wait a week or so, and then we're not totally 100% sure whether or not the right person actually won the election. You are correct. And I tell you, anything that will take away from people's um, confidence in the election is something that does not really need to be advanced at this particular time. Oh, for sure. And and I know that that's something that has been instrumental. I mean, yes, we're in unique times now, but uh, frankly, that's been something that's been instrumental to our country for a very long time. People have to be able to trust in the voting system because otherwise it's it's much harder to convince them to abide by a government that they're not <laughs> totally convinced is actually uh, subject to their vote and to be changed by their vote. That's correct. And I think that's another reason to seriously consider all of these questions that have been raised about universal voting by mail. So one question that I would have about Alabama specifically, is your department anticipating an influx of mail-in ballots due to the coronavirus? And if so, oh, are y'all prepared to deal with that? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, uh, the, the most number of absentee ballots that have ever been successfully cast in the history of the state is 88,000 plus in the 2016 Obama re-election effort. Uh, we believe that we're going to be well north of 150,000 absentee ballot applications by wow. October 29th, which is the last day to successfully submit an application. Now, the thing to remember about all of that is that people don't need to be concerned about whether or not their vote will make it through the mail process on October the 25th, October the 28th, or November the 2nd. The day to be concerned about that is August the 20th or August the 21st. That's the reason we're promoting it today. If you wait until then and then you say, well, I didn't have enough time, you have delayed the process yourself and you have made a conscious decision not to participate until you put yourself in peril. And it's just like a sign a lady used to have in the office in the Tuscaloosa County Board of Education mm -hmm. where she said, uh, poor planning on your part does not constitute an emergency on mine. <laughs> I, I've seen signs similar to that before, and, and I understand that, you know, if you're concerned about this, if you want to go ahead and get your, your vote in, you have a legitimate reason for absentee because Alabama is a state that you have to have some kind of excuse. Uh, yeah, but let me stop you right there okay. because this All right, is very ahead. important. It's yeah. very important for your listeners to know that the code and the Constitution of Alabama, whenever we're in a time of declared state of emergency, gives me the power and the authority as the Secretary of State to indicate a reason for all 3,631,381 voters to vote absentee. And mm. the box to check on the application is the one that says I'm ill or infirmed and will be unable to appear at my polling site on election day. That's the second box on the application. And then you make a copy of your photo ID. You submit that along with your completed application. You'll get your ballot uh, the second full week of September go ahead and complete it and return it. Okay, excellent. That, that's good because I wouldn't have known how to instruct people on how to do that. So I appreciate you bringing that information to us. Yes, sir. Um, one thing that I wanted to ask about too, uh, because the House, I'm sure that you were aware of this, they recently, and, and I'm talking about the United States House, uh, the House recently passed a coronavirus bill that actually included in the bill basically a federal law that would mandate every single state has to have universal mail-in ballots and also said that, and, and this was the th part that was most astounding to me, they actually had a provision that they had to allow for ballot harvesting. In other yes, words, and I testified against that legislation uh, before the House Committee on Administration. I was invited uh, by Congressman Rodney Davis from Illinois to testify on behalf of the Secretaries of State and election officials throughout the nation. Mm -hmm. And I, I will tell you that um, our words fell on deaf ears from the Democratic side. As a matter of fact, the Democratic chair of the committee actually cut me off when I was uh, telling her about one of the things that I knew was making it easier to vote and harder to cheat in Alabama, but she was having none of it. 
She didn't want to hear it. And since we weren't in Washington testifying, we were doing it through Zoom. Right. She just cut my mic off and I was not able to continue to make my presentation. So to, to give some background to our viewers, because I think that this is really important. And, and what scares me is that bill to me is an indication because it actually passed the House. I mean, obviously, it didn't go anywhere in the Senate, but uh, it's terrifying that that could be where the Democrats want to lead with having federal mandates on state elections. I think part of the reason that our voting is so consistent and is so secure and people by and large do have confidence, especially compared to other countries, is because we have a state by state system that the federal government can't control. And this would not only breach that, but but also the individual things that we were just talking about. So if you could just talk a little bit about some of the things that this bill would have done and, and why it's a bad idea. Well, exactly what you were talking about. And that's the reason Congressman Davis, who is the ranking member uh, on the House Committee on Administration, asked me to come because we believe that America is a democratic republic. And as a democratic republic, each and every state should be responsible for their own elections. Now, if people are doing things that are nefarious, if they're trying to prevent people from voting, if they're trying to engage in voter suppression, those things need to be called out. Sure. But these people that are calling out what we're doing, they're entitled to their own opinion, but they're not entitled to their own facts. And what we're doing is we're making it easier to vote and harder to cheat. And they don't like that because it, it takes away their narrative of their liberal agenda that they're trying to promote. And what we believe is that if a state wants to have universal voting by mail, they ought to be able to do so. But the federal government in Washington should not tell us that. If we believe that we should have voter ID, we ought to be able to have it if our people pass it. But we're not saying that every state in the union should have it because every state in the union should have their own choice as to what they need to do. So we need to be prepared to defend our positions and explain why that's best for our people, but we don't need to be trying to put a direction on each and every state in the union on what they need to do when it comes to elections. Well, I couldn't agree more because um, I may not like the voting laws in Maine or Idaho or California or Colorado, but that's really none of my business. I mean, I'm not voting in any of those states. Now, if they were disenfranchising people intentionally or like, unfortunately, there has been at least suspicion of uh, states passing laws in order to enable non-citizens to vote, then it becomes my business. But as far as uh, the, the state voting laws, as long as it's not something that it, you know, impedes somebody, that's really not something that I am personally concerned with. And I wish that other states took that same sentiment when it came to states like Alabama. Well, we certainly would be a lot better off. And yet one of the things that you just described is one of the things that we're currently seeing. I mean, there are states in the union that are enabling voters to participate that are non-citizens. Right. That's a problem, my friend. Oh, for sure. And we, have, we have to continue to push back against that liberal narrative that just because you can fog a mirror and you're currently residing in that particular place, then you need to be able to vote. I mean, that's no different than me visiting the Methodist church next Sunday. And as a uh, Christian Southern Baptist member of Calvary Baptist church, me voting when they say, okay, we're going to call a new pastor at the Methodist church that they don't need my input. I'm not a member of their church. Right. That doesn't that mean way. that they're dehumanizing you or think that you're not a nice guy. You're just not a member of the church. That's exactly right. So uh, on the uh, bill, could you could you give the audience a little background in voting harvesting? Because that's one that really scares me. And I, I know a little bit about it, but I'm sure that you would be uh, better able to articulate that and, and explain that to the audience as well. Well, the ballot harvesting effort would indicate that a particular individual would be able to gather ballots from multiple people and turn them in at one time as the courier. Mm -hmm. of those ballots, taking them to the place where they would be counted at the central receiving site. That's a problem. In Alabama, that's illegal right. because the only person that can turn their ballot in is the voter. You cannot even turn your ballot in for your wife. As a matter of fact, 
if you submitted an absentee ballot application with another person's in the same envelope, then that's going to be rejected. Same thing if you returned a ballot with another voter's ballot going to be rejected because that's not permissible by state law this is even going above that to say that once you receive your ballot you mark your ballot then someone else can take your ballot and turn it in for you who's to say that person might change your ballot if they chose to or if they were able to get your ballot before you even received it complete it for you and return it on your behalf unbeknownst to you well, and, and that's one of the things that concerns me. Of course, the ballot harvesting would, would be an issue that we're talking about where you could just, you know, change somebody's vote on the way in. But that's one of my issues, and it kind of alludes to my, one of my issues with the universal ballot, is like, for example, I have a sister. And granted, this one doesn't 100% work with her because she's now a citizen of the state of Mississippi. But let's say that her official legal address were still the same as mine. And I just happened to get her ballot in the mail. Well, I could just mark it off and then send it in without her ever knowing if I just happen to be the one that checks the mail. And so, I I mean, like you could have somebody voting three, four, five times that, you know, just that's just their vote and their opinion. And they're the one sending it in. But their whole family may just not know that their ballots have come in and their ballots have already been sent in. And look, we're already seeing that in states like California, where 83 ballots were mailed to one apartment in a particular (laughs) apartment complex, and only two people lived in that apartment. And that's a problem because those people could take those ballots, mark them for the candidate of their choice, and submit it on their behalf. Oh, oh, for sure. And, and we have had real life scenarios where that happened. We had one that, uh, what was it? I believe it was in Florida, if I'm not mistaken, that they found out that there were people that were going through people's mailboxes and just taking random people's ballots and then signing them and mailing them in. Of course they were. And we continue to see that all across the country. And that's a major, major problem, but one we will not be having in Alabama. Well, it does uh, fill me with confidence on that. So let's say that there's somebody that is interested in doing an absentee ballot. They, they need to go ahead and get that done. Uh, what would the steps that they need to take to go ahead and, and get that process started if they were going to do it right now? Well, they're very simple. There's a couple of them, actually. If you're going to vote absentee in person, you can go to the absentee election manager's office, complete the application on site, You can present your photo ID. They will make a copy of that. They will check it. Then they will give you your ballot. You can vote for the candidate of your choice on site. You can do that early. Now, if you'd rather do it by mail, you can call the absentee election manager's office. They will mail you an absentee ballot application. You successfully complete it. Mm -hmm. Then when they process it, they'll send you your ballot in the mail. You also can download your absentee ballot application at alabamavotes.gov. It's in a fillable PDF. You can complete it and then submit it through the mail. Then they'll forward you your ballot when those are able to be processed. Then you vote for the candidate of your choice. Then your vote will be opened on election day, November the 3rd. And that's the procedure. All right. Well, thank you so much for being with us, Secretary Merrill. Is there anything that maybe I didn't think to talk about or to ask you about that you may need to let the audience know? Nothing I can think of, but if you need to reach me, you know where I'm at, and I'm always excited to talk to you. Well, thank you so much, Secretary Merrill. You've always been generous with your time, and we certainly appreciate you taking the time to reach out to the voters of Alabama and make sure that they know that their votes are going to be counted and only be counted once. Thank you, my friend. All right. I appreciate it. That is, of course, Secretary of State John Merrill, the Secretary of State of the great state of Alabama. And if you do have any interest in, in, you know, this process or to learn more about it, he has a website that you can go to. You can get in touch with him. He's one of the most accessible public officials that I've ever dealt with. And and that is high praise coming from me. My mother always said, if you can't say something nice about somebody, then you're probably talking about a leftist. Nah, I kid. But seriously, it would really help me out if you would like this video and subscribe to my channel. I'm 
sure my mom would appreciate it. 